right. Well, for those already here and seated, welcome to the University of Idaho Integrated Design Lab and the Spring Lecture Series for 2010. Um, we, uh, we're glad to have you back and glad to be providing this service. The exciting thing for, for this uh, particular series is that we've got Montana State and Washington State University both roped in. Uh, I understand at WSU there's a, a room full uh, watching online, so welcome to WSU. Uh, we always like to say thanks to our sponsors, which are Better Bricks and then uh, directly the electric utilities primarily. Uh, Idaho Power here locally in Montana, Northwestern Energy, and up in uh, Spokane region, Avista. Uh, for those, there's several people busily signing in over there, so if you've managed to make it to your seat without signing in, please uh, remember to do that on your way out. Uh, that's how we can ensure that we can keep bringing these lectures to town. And uh, for folks who are viewing online, we are trying to do, for the first time, CEUs, Continuing Education Units, uh, offered online as well. Um, so we will track folks who have uh, watched the course, and then tomorrow uh, you'll be getting an email with a test which is required by AIA for online CEUs. Um, as of now, we'll only be offering CEUs online for folks with an AIA number. And folks in the room, if you're an engineer and you need uh, CEUs, there's uh, self-certifying forms available on the back table, which look like these. Um, what else do we need to talk through? Uh, we are also uh, required uh, for the first time to do a formal evaluation. So there's a simple one-page, 11-item evaluation form that we'll pass out during the Q&A section near the end of the day. And if you would please uh, help us out by taking a little bit of time to fill those in, that would be really appreciated. Um, the other lectures, uh, I'll, I'll introduce Rob Pena here in a moment, but the other lectures uh, in the spring series are uh, the, next, the next class will be, or the next lecture will be April 8th, and that is a team that worked on the College of Southern Idaho's Health Science Human Services building. So it's uh, CTA, architects and engineers, uh, as well as construction, um, the construction uh, general contracting team, just STAR as well as a representative from the College of Southern Idaho. On April 15th, our very own Ari Junedi is going to be talking about uh, right sizing of rooftop units. Uh, and then there are two more. On April 22nd, uh, we'll have Louis Capozzi coming from the Genzyme building in Boston, Mass. And uh, talking about, he's the building operator, and talking about the trials and, and uh, successes of making that building operate to its top performance. And then finally, on April 29th, we'll have another uh, presenter from University of Washington. So we'll open it and close it with University of Washington this time. Uh, on April 29th, we've got Heather Burpee coming back, who's presented here at least one other time on high performance hospitals uh, with an update on her research process. So uh, one or two more announcements. Uh, you should have seen by now through one of the email strings uh, the announcements for the Thomas Auer lecture. Uh, it is April 27th from 11 a, 11.30 a.m. to 1 p.m. It's going to be at the Doubletree, and food's going to be provided, so we have to collect a fee on this one of, uh, I believe, $15 ahead of time or $20 at the door. Um, checks, uh, there's information about where to make the checks out to. Uh, register with us here at the lab. And uh, Thomas Auer is a wonderful energy, re energy engineer from TransSolar in Germany. Uh, this is part of the... Uh, transformational lecture series similar to when we had Guy Battle come out last year. And lastly, uh, Building Simulation Users Group is going again. So uh, every second Wednesday of the month uh, over the noon hour. And it's uh, focusing on energy modeling and sometimes daylight modeling. Okay. Questions in the room? Make sure you speak loudly. Rob, if you can try to help us by repeating the question so it can be transcribed over the video airwaves. And uh, folks online, email me, kevinv, at uidaho.edu, and we'll do our best to get your questions. Bathrooms are upstairs and downstairs. And with that, I want to uh, thank Rob Pena for coming out and turn the floor over to him very quickly. Uh, Rob Pena comes from the University of Washington, uh, hails from many different parts of the world. He's got friends here in the room. He's spent summers uh, working as an architect here in Idaho. 
uh, has a year uh, of working with Ed Mazaria as a, as a younger architect, as a younger architectural designer, and then spent five or six years with Sim Vanderen. Uh, he has taught uh, building systems and energy, uh, energy sort of low-tech low building systems in architecture schools at Eugene, Montana State, in not the correct order here, but Montana State, Eugene, Cal Poly, uh, San Luis Obispo, and then most recently you've been at UW for three years? Just about three years. Okay, so with that, Rob, thanks for coming, and I will turn the floor over to you. Thank you very much, Kevin. It, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, what, I'm, what I'd like to do this afternoon is break up the slides that I have into two parts with a bit of time in between to get some discussion going and some questions. But before we start, let me get a sense of, of the demographics here. How many of you are architecture students? Okay, students in another discipline. Okay, and uh, practitioners, architectural practitioners. Great. Okay, I think that just about covers. Engineers, Engineers excuse me. Engineers. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a former engineer, so uh, I'm in good company here. Thank you for having me here. You know, I, I think every, what, what I'm fundamentally going to talk about today is uh, ideas and, and strategies for making buildings that, per, that are higher performing. Fundamentally, my interest is energy. And um, it started, you know, as a child growing up in northern New Mexico when um, I, I both saw the impact of burning coal. We have a coal burning power plant in northwestern uh, New Mexico that was really changing what we saw. And at the same time, Dennis Hayes um, and others started Earth Day when I was uh, in about junior high. And at, at the National Lab in Los Alamos, there was some pioneering work going on in solar energy. And these conflude in my interest in architecture um, to point the way towards buildings that use a lot less energy because they rely on you know, solar energy, passive solar energy. And that started me down the path that I'm in today. I think it's probably useful at the beginning of uh, uh, of a discussion like this to, to set a little bit of framework. How many of you know about Architecture 2030? Okay, talk a little bit about it now. And the Living Building Challenge. Good. Um, what I'd like to do today, I was, I was trying to think on the way out here, and ironically, I, I burned a lot of fossil fuel to get here, so I have to make this really, you know, worth, worth those, uh, those, that, those carbon credits. Um, and, and I, I read a, a beautiful address that David Orr, a real hero of mine, great writer, wrote. And it, this was an address to students at the University of Pennsylvania, the design students. And he was sending them out into the world. And, and he started with this. So I, I want to um, quote David Orr here. And he says, um, it said that, we, that we're entitled to hold whatever, um, excuse me, it is, it is said that we're entitled to hold whatever opinions we choose, but are not entitled to whatever facts we wish. I think about this often in our, in our present day political climate. And he goes on to say, whatever opinions you, you may have, there are three facts that will fundamentally shape the world that, that we live in. The first is the fact that we spend upwards of 95% of our time in houses, cars, malls, and offices. We are increasingly an indoor species. Um, and as a, as a result, nature is becoming more and more of an abstraction. And this problem is most severe um, among children who now spend up to eight hours a day in front of a computer screen or other uh, video device and increasingly lose a connection to place, that placeness that we get when we spend time in our place and in nature. Um, author Richard Love describes this as nature deficit disorder. The second fact has been particularly difficult for a society built on a foundation of cheap, portable fossil fuel to acknowledge. We are at or near um, the year of peak oil extraction, the point at which we'll, we will have consumed the easy and better, um, and better half of the accessible oil. The other half is harder to refine, farther out and deeper down, and mostly located in places where people don't like us. 
We've known about this for decades, um, and yet we still lack a coherent energy policy to address this. Um, and, and this procrastination puts us vulnerable to um, supply interruptions and volatile energy prices. And the third fact, there's a third fact, and that is that 150 years ago or so, the atmospheric levels of CO2 were about 280 parts per million. Uh, now those levels of all human generated heat trapping gases is about 430 parts per million of CO2. Um, according to scientists who have participated in writing the fourth report for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, we're not just warming the earth, but destabilizing the entire planet. Climate scientist James Hansen says that we are close to making the Earth a different planet and one that we'll not like very much. Now in light of these, these facts, one of them has to do with our ability to connect to life and to the largeness of the human spirit. One of them has to do with our wisdom and our creativity as designers in the face of limits to the biosphere. And one of them has to do with our ability to act quickly and to change our course as well as our re resilience to a future that is argu arguably going to be less stable and predictable. These are our challenges as designers. So in our world, and we know that buildings are responsible for anywhere from a third to a half of the uh, operational and embodied energy that we consume, um, how did we get here? What's, what's a bit of the background for this as, as in the built environment? And the first thing I'd like to point out is that we used to build green buildings all the time. In fact, all of our buildings were green before about a little over a century ago. And that was because we didn't really have much choice. These were places, buildings, our habitations were rooted in place. They were built from traditional know-how with the materials close at hand. They were built to last. And they were fundamentally tied to our climate because we really didn't have the means to heat or cool our buildings except by fundamentally natural means. And we could, we had limited ability to heat with fire, but that, that's always been an expensive proposition. And what we see in these buildings from uh, before the 20th century is a fundamental connection to place. Drop yourself down into any of these locales, and you'd have a pretty good idea of where you are. This all started to change um, really only with the Industrial Revolution and our increasing urbanization that happened at the end of the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century. It, it's, um, in fact, our very first buildings it had that were mechanically heated and cooled are only a little over 100 years old. And here's an early example of that. This is the Royal Victoria Hospital uh, built in Belfast, 1903. One of the things that I find really interesting about this building is it is a building that's responding directly to the times, to an industrialized environment, to the burning of coal, and to, and to the health concerns um, that came about because of this. When you look at this building in plan, you also see a building whose form is fundamentally tied to the kind of mechanical systems it uses. And you can start to see this in two parts, and I'm going to use this so that the folks watching online can see what I'm talking about. There are the hospital wards themselves, which is really densely packed. We can think of it as a high internal load um, part of the building, and this is where the beds are. There's surgical wards up here. It's pretty hard to see from this image, but surgical wards up here. And this is the part of the building that has that, um, that's mechanically heated and ventilated, primarily to get fresh air as well as tempered air in here. Whereas there's this other part of the building which looks much more like buildings of the 19th century and before. These, I, I like to think of them as alphabet buildings. O's, U's, L's. You know, they were built this way because you had to have access to light and fresh air. And these, this part of the building were the um, staff quarters and offices. These were not mechanically conditioned. And the way this building, and then there's this one curious part here. Let's see if we can get it to come up. So there's the naturally ventilated part of the building, fireplaces provided heating. And here's the mechanical system 
right up here at the, uh, at the head of this. Really fascinating the way this building works. It's organized along this monumental duct that runs the full length of this building. Big, long duct, a corridor. Starts about nine feet deep, runs the entire length. And here you can see what happens in the mechanical space. Um, hot water um, from an adjacent um, laundry facility is brought into these two portions of the building. These are identical, um, basically, air handling systems. And these are sisal fibers, sisal mats. And hot water is constantly poured down these mats. And then there's a giant um, fan, a big fan in here, that's sucking air past these fibers to clean it and to heat it, to temper that air before it travels down this giant duct that you can see down here, that duct that I mentioned before. And then here are those branch ducts, those inlet ducts, that go off to the wards and provide fresh air to those wards. And there you can see sort of a cutaway of how that works. You can see that um, the inlet to those wards is up here. Okay. And then the extracts, they actually extract air down here. And that extract air then makes its way over here and up and out those cupolas at the end. So the whole building is very cleverly organized in direct response to the mechanical system. Uh, um, one of the early examples of form following the mechanical system of the building. It's another building, one that pretty much everyone studies at one point or another in architecture school. The Larkin Building, Frank Lloyd Wright. Uh, no longer, the, the building is no longer standing. 1906, and this is another building whose form is really driven by the mechanical systems that help this building um, provide its occupants with fresh air. You know, this is a really progressive uh, building form. It was built right along the railroad tracks, and trains at that time burned coal, so it was a, a fairly polluted spot. What happens in this building is there are air inlets, let's see if I can find them, air inlets up here. These corner pieces, which really anchor the building and give it that kind of monumental scale, um, those served a function in the building. These were the, um, not only circulation cores, but you can see these gaps in here. These are places where air was brought down and brought into mechanical spaces underneath. And then there's these other um, shafts, which let's see if I can do this. Right down here and right down here, you can see those. And in the elevation, you can see that that's what's behind here and behind here. And these are chases. Fresh air is brought in, brought down into, the, into a boiler room where it's heated, and then brought back up, and then brought into the room along the, and, and emptied into this litrium through these, at the bases of these balustrades around the core. So this is a building that attempts to use natural daylighting to illuminate the place and mechanical conditioning. Again, mechanical systems um, have a huge influence on the form of this building. Throughout the, through the 20th century, we see this evolution from these early examples of these buildings that were employing these new systems to um, these international style buildings. Here's the Seagram's building from down below where the mechanical systems start to become suppressed. And this is really the paradigm that's, that, that we live with today. These are the sort of Cinderella's quietly working their way, tucked away in the building usually not very much a part of the architectural expression, suppressed in the building and making these buildings all um, capable of operating. You know, if you're, if you're observing carefully, you start to see oh, um, this whole portion up here is all devoted to air handling. It looks a little bit different. You can see it expressed here. But for the most part, the mechanical conditioning of these buildings is suppressed. And these buildings wouldn't function for very long without um, their connection to uh, an energy source and their robust mechanical systems to make them work. 
So these high-rise buildings are really highly dependent on mechanical systems powered by fossil fuels. Excuse me, the Seagram's building, I think I called it something else. We see this ex expression uh, really taken to an extreme in the Farnsworth House, M Mies van der Rohe's Farnsworth House built in uh, Fox River, Illinois. The design winter um, temperature for this climate is um, minus six degrees Fahrenheit. This is single pane glass in this building. How do you think you inhabit a building like this when it's below zero and you're in this box of glass? Any, any ideas? What do you do? How do you, uh, what do you do? How do you, how do you, how do you temper a building like this? Any ideas? Let's see if I've got a slide of it. Well, you counter it with, uh, I, I guess, the equivalent of, uh, of, of sunshine, radiant heat. Um, and this actually has a radiant floor. So you've got all this radiant cool all around you, and the floor has embedded tubes, copper tubes, and water going through it, an early hydronic system. And that's, that's how it works. That's how this building has any chance of uh, you know, achieving some measure of thermal comfort. Probably not very comfortable with that glass at you know, sub-zero temperatures. So again, we see this legacy of climate rejecting buildings. These buildings whose expression now, they're, they're, they're freed, in, their architectural expression is freed from the constraints of adapting to the climate. And they're operating um, by using really powerful mechanical systems powered by fossil fuels. Here you can see the United Nations building, which has every so often you can see a little bit of a hint of those mechanical systems, air handling, air handling and air handling here. But this is a building that's elongated north-south. And it's a building where on a cold spring day when the sun rises and strikes this east face, you introduce suddenly a need for cooling. Whereas the, on the other side of the hall, basically, on the west side of the building, you have a need for heating. And the two systems are sometimes operating at the same time, both air conditioning and cooling. A building, again, that wouldn't be very uh, inhabitable without these mechanical systems and the fossil fuel that provides them. 101 California in San Francisco. And here we see another example of a climate rejecting building. And, and I would argue that a building whose um, choice of a reflective facade is going to necess necessitate um, decades of unnecessary electric lighting because that reflective coating also reduces the visible light transmittance into this building, which causes two problems. One is you need more electric light to illuminate the space, plus that electric light then introduces um, heat, which has to be taken away by the air conditioning. So you get this double whammy effect. So early decisions designers in the earliest stages of design have long, long-term consequences on the way these buildings perform and their impact on the environment. Up into the 80s, a building in Portland, Oregon, which was you know, emblematic of this uh, postmodern era, short-lived postmodern era. Uh, my friend Steve Bedanes likes to call this type of building all face and no space. Um, there, there clearly is not a big effort to connect people inside of the building with outside when you think about those small punched openings. Um, a building that's much more about architectural expression than either energy use or connection with nature. Arguably the result of this, the result of this legacy and, and, and perhaps the flip side of the freedom that we've had to design um, free from the constraints of, of the climate are buildings that really are somewhat placeless. You know, the same buildings in Abu Dhabi could be in Anchorage. And, and we lose that sense of, of placeness, that sense of place, in addition to the impacts these buildings have on the environment through their use of energy. Uh, one final thing I'd say in, in, in on this subject is that 
we should also remember that our buildings are the most durable artifacts of our, of our society. They outlive us. They last an awful long time. Um, and they continue to exert their influence on the environment long after we designers have gone, moved on. Um, I, I'm, I'm, one illustration of this is the kind of advances that can take place in the automotive industry where, there's, where we replace our cars on a much more regular basis than we do our, our houses. So we see these advances over 50 years from this old Chevy, um, a vehicle that is much less, uh, uh, uses much less fossil fuel, has a lower effect on the uh, impact on the environment. Unfortunately, our, our residences, which again last for a long time, this was the house I lived in in San Luis Obispo. It was about the same vintage as that Chevy and operated just about as efficiently. Um, uninsulated walls, an old, an old uh, gas fired heater. Um, and this was the, the building that um, we built with students at Cal Poly to take to Washington, D.C., which was in a sense the, sort of the equivalent of the Prius, you know, a contemporary building with a, a, a well-insulated, tight envelope, um, advanced mechanical systems, an attempt to both use as little energy as possible by making good architectural decisions, and then to supplement what energy is needed with um, photovoltaic and solar thermal technology. This is the direction we certainly want to be going, and arguably not in this direction. All right. This illustration on the right, I think, is a good reminder of what I mentioned before, this sort of the Cinderella, the mechanical systems quietly whirring away, making it possible for, for us to inhabit these uh, urban high-rise buildings. And they're connected reliably to some source, in this country primarily um, coal and natural gas um, in the Northwest um, hydroelectric. So we're in a f at, we've reached a fork in the road. <laughs> and um, <laughs> we, have to, we have to now rethink uh, our, our, our strategy, we think our, rethink the existing paradigm. And I, I want to provide a few, I, a few concepts for the way we might approach this, this, uh, this new and hopefully better paradigm of architecture, one that isn't, rely, isn't re so reliant on fossil fuels. As Dennis Hay says, uh, breathtakingly cheap fossil fuels. The first concept that I, that I want to throw out here is this idea of building our buildings the same way nature builds plants and animals. Um, all things in nature respond to the particulars of their place and adapt to the conditions of their environment and evolve a whole set of adaptive strategies to thrive in their particular environments. We see that in plants. We see that in animals. And arguably, we see that in traditional um, human dwellings. Ralph Knowles put out this idea of, of collecting these mechanisms in a set of baskets that I think are pretty useful. And the first basket we'll call location. And location has as corollaries how a building, and we're talking about buildings now, how a building is oriented how our buildings are set in relationship to each other, so how they're juxtaposed, how far apart, um, their relationship to each other and to uh, other site features, and migration. Now, we don't typically move our buildings around. Some, some do, but, but there are, uh, migration is, is a pretty good adaptive strategy in buildings as well. Think of a porch. Think of the way you might retreat to the cool of a basement on a really hot, day or move up stairs uh, on a, when you're, you're running your fireplace and the heat is moving to the top of, of, a, of a space. But migration is a good, uh, a good design strategy. The next one would be form. And form has a number of corollaries. Shape would be one. How you shape a building has influence on how it adapts to the environment. 
related to that is the idea of surface to volume. How susceptible is a building to environmental stress? Buildings that are tightly compacted tend to have less susceptibility to uh, environmental stress. Buildings that are perhaps elongated and have more surface to volume um, have more susceptibility to environmental stress. The envelopes and the openings, I mean, this has to do with insulation and openings. And then the third basket is metabolism or chemical conversion. Now, if we think of, of the way our buildings used to work, our buildings used to rely primarily on these first two sets of strategies and all those corollaries in order to use less energy and adapt to the environment. Those were, those were givens in architectural design because metabolic means were either non-existent or expensive. I would argue that over the course of the 20th century, that paradigm has shifted completely. And now, um, we, we, location and form have very little to do with a, um, adaption to the environment because we have the metabolic means to make our buildings work. So I'm arguing for a return to the, uh, the traditional strategies of, of, of depending more on location and form and less on metabolism. So here's a couple metabolic means, fire and evaporation. Some are le have less impact than others. Humans have, have a, a remarkable ability to adapt to a whole range of environmental conditions. Um, but in order to really thrive, we need permanent, durable dwellings. And we see these, the, the uh, we see the relics of these here in the southwest, these massive permanent dwellings. And we also see some good strategies for uh, adaption to the environment. Cliff Palace arguably uses these strategies to adapt to the environment. By tucking in underneath that cliff, we can see that in the, in the winter time, uh, it's more fully exposed to the sun during the course of the day, whereas in the summertime, it's nicely shaded most of the time from the hot summer sun. So a good strategy in terms of location and orientation. This was one summer I lived up outside of uh, Haley, Idaho, and uh, here are a few uh, adaptive strategies. Um, right after architecture school, the, the first piece of architecture that I was involved with was, was a teepee. I, I, I made my own teepee. I was working for Outward Bound, living in eastern Utah. And uh, I made a, a Sioux teepee. And I, I learned a lot about adaptive strategies living in that wonderful dwelling. Um, you can see there how the shell of the teepee doesn't make it all the way to the ground. And there's a liner that sits inside, for those of you who have lived in teepees, that wraps around the inside of the poles. And then, in the case of, uh, of this teepee, tucks in underneath uh, a canvas floor. So you have an air space, and you have a constant upwelling of air, you know, just like a cooling tower, moving up and out the smoke flaps of that teepee, which you can adjust to face downwind because you want uh, you know, positive pressure, the wind, to be pushing on the, this side of the teepee so that you have a, a draw, negative pressure, on the other side. That's what pulls out the smoke, and that, in the summertime, creates a great uh, flow of ventilation. Um, I also discovered that it's, you know, it's almost a mosquito-free zone because you've got this constant upwelling of air that's moving bugs out of, the, out of the zone, which was a nice surprise. It's a fully integrated structure. Your shell is keeping out the, the wind and the rain, but it's also illuminating the inside. It's a beautifully illuminated space. And at night, a single candle, because of these nice white circular walls, illuminates the place quite nicely. You know, arguably, that trailer was also pretty good, um, a pretty good migratory means of uh, adaptation. It was my kitchen. 
Here's another um, example of migration as an adaptive strategy, and this is a cross-section through Acoma Pueblo. And what you see here is both um, a warm season day and night and a cool season day and night. On the warm season day, um, retreating to the, these high thermal mass interiors where it's cool, you're going to find yourself more comfortable, moving out onto the terraces and the great radiant heat loss at night to that clear desert sky uh, makes that a comfortable place to be. Now, on a, on a sunny but cool winter day, the south facing terraces make a great sun pocket, all the while the thermal mass of the stone and mud structures is, is, is uh, storing up some of that solar radiation and releasing it to the inside during the, during the night. Here we see a, a wonderful set of adaptive strategies, water, evaporation, the cool th of these courtyards, these Mediterranean patterns which work so well in this dry climate. Another contemporary example, um, C. Bedanes and Jersey Devil, the Palmetto House in, in Florida. And here we can see the strategy is keep the sun out in the summertime, provide for good ventilation, and keep the radiant heat out as well. There's radiant barriers in that nice hat that's nicely overhanging, jalousy windows to provide lots of flow through air, this steel graded floor so the bed, even the bedroom can benefit from um, as much air movement as possible in this um, hot and humid climate. Another Jersey Devil house, one of my favorites, this is uh, Casa Mariposa down in uh, the Baja Peninsula. And again, this is a building that uses a lot of great strategies to adapt to the climate. It's got a really switch-rich envelope, an envelope that allows you to open up and take advantage of the prevailing breezes off the ocean to cool you off. Um, Steve likes to joke that the, the design guidelines um, for, this, for this second home development uh, was aiming for um, pitched roofs, they didn't say gable, pitched roofs, um, clay tile roofs. And he said, well, they didn't tell us which way they had to pitch. And they didn't say what kind of clay tiles they had to use. So he used uh, floor clay tiles on the roof and used the curved ones to create screen at the end of these roof elements that allow breezes to flow through. One nice strategy that I particularly like is you can see these, um, how there are these three pods, you can't see the other two, three enclosed pods in this house, but there's these breezeways that go all the way through. And here the kitchen, which is a source of unwanted heat, is built in its own little kiosk um, so that it doesn't contribute unwanted heat gains to the inside of the house. A great strategy used in the, in the south, uh, in Charleston, you see this used in traditional uh, houses, and Steve and Jersey Devil used it here. I mentioned before, this, this, is, um, this was my teepee when it was set up in, in uh, Utah. Some of those adaptive strategies there, you can see the liner and that airspace. I guess one other thing I should mention about this is I think it's kind of useful also when we think about the various spectrums that architecture lies on, architectural strategies. One would be an open frame, climate accepting architecture, which this certainly is. We can see that adapted by Skidmore Owings and Merrill in this uh, part of the airport terminal in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, to, um, to accommodate the influx of pilgrims passing through. And here we see some of the same strategies, these um, um, basically cooling towers, shade structures, uh, luminous shade structures, many of the same strategies as the teepee. And then at the other end of the spectrum, we have these climate rejecting closed shell buildings, also a perfectly reasonable strategy for adapting to the climate, rejecting the climate. A good, durable closed shell, Taos Pueblo, North Africa on the left, and some contemporary adaptations of that. Ed Masria's La Vereda compound in Santa Fe. You can see mimics a lot of the forms of the Taos Pueblo. 
um, but adapts with some, some contemporary solar strategies. Attached sun spaces, recessing the openings so that they benefit from the fixed shading of the overhangs. One more important concept, and I'll just mention a couple others before we look at some examples. It's always really important, and this is really directed at the students' you know, audience, to always remember what kind, what, what building type you're working on, because in terms of their adaption to the, to the climate and how they work thermally and metabolically, at one end of the spectrum we have these envelope dominated buildings. They're typically small, they typically have low internal heat gains, and their need for energy is generally dominated by space heating which is determined by heat losses through the building envelope. And they have something called a, um, a, they have a relatively high balance point temperature. That means they, they reach thermal equilibrium at a relatively high outdoor temperature because they don't have a lot of internal loads to heat themselves. Whereas these buildings at the other end of the spectrum, internal load dominated buildings, typically large, lots of internal gains, more likely to need cooling because they have lots of people lights and equipment and they have a typically low balance point temperature and this is why even in Seattle certainly in San Francisco these buildings start needing air conditioning even when it's 50 degrees outside okay just very briefly I'll say if we're if we're going to be making buildings that are climate adaptive, one of the things we need to be able to do really well with our clients and uh, in our own work is get a really clear picture of the conditions of the climate. I have four pictures here. This is taking data and starting to articulate it in pictures so that we can eventually come up with what's really important, which are what are our priorities and what kind of architectural strategies address each of those priorities. Let me just show you an example of that. So here's, I'll show you this two hour temperature map. One of the things I like to do, by the way, if you're, if you're ever, many of you probably know this source. For those of us who work in the West, this is probably the best single source of climate data. Get it all in one spot. The Western Regional Climate Center or WRCC, if you Google that, you'll come up with this. You can come up, you'll come up with a map. You can type, you can just um, click Boise or Pocatello or whatever city you're working in and immediately come up with a nice climate summary. But then you need to turn that into a nice picture, like this picture, a psychrometric chart that helps articulate what's going on. And I'm actually gonna skip through these. Um, but the point I want to make with these is by making a good picture of the climate, then you can come up with these priorities. And I think that's something that, that is really important if we're going to make these climate responsive buildings. So for this uh, mixed climate, keep the heat in and cold temperatures out. That's in most of the country our number one priority for, for envelope dominated buildings. Natural ventilation for summer cooling, let the winter sun in, protect from summer sun, cold and protect from cold winter winds. So you see summer and winter strategies interspersed. One more in there. Southern California, a little different. And you can see a psychrometric chart, if you know how to read one of these, that indicates a much more temperate climate that, that suggests a much more climate accepting set of strategies. Switch rich envelope, protect from the summer sun, let the winter sun in, and you're good to go. Switch rich buildings. Oh, natural ventilation. And thermal mass works well here to temper day to night temperature swings. In the Pacific Northwest, we see mostly winter strategies that we're familiar with, and there's a summer strategy at the end, a couple of summer strategies. But we're more concerned with heat loss. All right. Let me finish this part with one more, one more concept, and then we'll look at some buildings. And this is this idea that, that I like to think of as architectural sailing. 
If this is the, the inside temperature range we'd like to keep a building at, let's say 68 to 78 degrees, closer to 68 in the wintertime, not letting it go much more than 78 in the summertime. Okay, this seems like a pretty reasonable summertime range or annual range of temperatures. I've kind of arbitrarily picked a temperature of 55 degrees as a balance point temperature. Okay, that's a temperature at which a building's roughly in equilibrium without having to heat or cool. That's the outside temperature in order to keep the inside at 68 to 78. And in a conventional commercial building that may not have operable windows, it's either operating in mechanical heating on when it's below that balance point temperature or ventilation and eventually chillers on the other side. So this is sort of the, the existing paradigm. A more mixed mode approach says, well, what we'd really like to do is stretch out our strategies so that we have a period in between where we can sail the building. And arguably, this is somewhere above the balance point temperature and below that temperature at which we need to close down the building and possibly turn on the air conditioners, the change over temperature. Okay? Now our trick here in this climate is to maximize that open period. In other words, to drive that balance point temperature that way. And we can drive the balance point temperature lower by making a better insulated envelope and by managing our internal gains, using our internal gains to help heat the building. There's, there's strategies that are architectural for heating, storing heat and thermal mass and direct solar gain, and then that are mechanical but more benign like active solar. And then on the cooling side, thermal mass is again our friend. Some evaporative cooling, pretty low, low impact way, and stirring the air. These are low, low energy means of responding during these closed modes without having to turn on the chiller. Finally, and I'll end this part with this slide, for me this is one of the better pictures to think about a climate. And this is a little two hour temperature chart. And all you do is you take the January high and low temperatures for your climate. And this is a, a little Excel spreadsheet that I'd be glad to share with anyone who wants this. And once you put in the high and low for a, for a month, then the spreadsheet assumes that you're on, on basically a sine, sinusoidal curve between uh, the high and the low, with the low temperature occurring around 4 a.m. and the high temperature occurring around 4 p.m. And what you can do here is if you start to estimate what the balance point temperature is, you can start to see what percentage of the time you might need to be in closed heating mode, in open sailing mode, and in closed cooling mode. And we see in Seattle, we don't have much of a, typically much of a cooling load at all, and a pretty high proportion of the time open sailing. And then if we take that one step further, we can start to see that for an occupied building, such as a classroom or office, that we even, that proportion changes a little more. So this helps us get a real quick sense of what's the scale of the issue, a good way to do some climate analysis. So if we did this for Boise, it looks a little different. It's a little hotter here. Now remember, this is for a particular set of assumptions, saying that my balance point temperature is around 55. And as soon as we start lowering that, we start increasing that open sailing area where we're not using any energy. All right. I'm going to end there for the first half, take some questions, uh, and uh, take just a real short break. Do you have any, any comments or questions on this first part that you'd like to bring up? And Kevin, shall we roll right in, given the web presence? I think so, yeah. Okay. You'd probably, you'd probably like to see some buildings. Let me show you some. Let me start with this concept, net zero energy. 
Thanks to the folks at the bottom of the slide for this one. Okay, so here's where we're at. here's where we're heading. So once we've gotten, we're we're working effectively with that set of architectural principles to make our buildings use a lot less energy architecturally. What we want to start doing is look at all of the things that use energy in our building: heating, lighting, cooling, equipment, pumps and fans, and hot water. Divide that by the gross building area, and that gives us our EUI, energy use index, energy use index sometimes called energy utility uh, in index, intensity, intensity or index, EUI, okay? And once we know our EUI, then that, give, then that gives us a sense of how much energy we need to produce on site with solar thermal or photovoltaics to come up with net zero energy. And typically we do this on an annual basis. In Seattle, we'd have a hard time otherwise because we get sunshine in the summer, but not so much in the wintertime. Okay, so this is the idea of EUI, and I think increasingly, um, in my work with architects in Seattle, people, um, architects know this number for most of their buildings now, or know the range that most of their buildings need to be in. And let's look at some of those ranges. Here in some office buildings um, around the world, we see a national average of somewhere just below 100. And remember, this is kilobtus per square foot per year. And we see a range from about uh, um, 35 or so for this building at the National Renewable Energy Lab, this real low energy building in Switzerland that's down below 20. Um, the Audubon Center in Wisconsin, which is one of the greenest buildings in this country right now, it comes in around 35, 34 of an e as a EUI. And then our first LEED Platinum building from about a decade ago the Chesapeake Bay Foundation building, which comes in at about 40. Okay, so that gives you a range of what the EUI is. And this is, you know, the, the single number that really encapsulates how much energy our buildings are using. Let's look at the Northwest. So there's our national average again. And here are some buildings in the Northwest. Um, and I'll show you one of these, the Terry Thomas building in Seattle. But we can see these office buildings. These are all um, office type buildings. The good ones are coming in right around 40, a little bit below 40. Terry Thomas, a little below 40. And then this building that's in design, which is a big one, 220,000 square feet, that's aiming for less than 20 for an EUI. So let me show you um, Terry Thomas. How many of you have been to Terry Thomas in Seattle? OK. This is a, a Weber Thompson design building. Um, it got a Committee on the Environment Top 10 Award. It's in the South Lake Union District, a handsome building. It's an O building. It's got a courtyard in the middle. Uh, you can see some of the strategies right away. It's got a lot of glazing. We're looking at the north side, the north and east side of the building. The south side has an adjacent building on it. And there you can kind of see what some of the uh, strategies are. This is a building that's trying to lower its energy use by being really simple and architecturally direct. It doesn't have ducts because it's ventilating completely through the envelope, either through trickle vents in the wintertime or operable winters the rest of the time. Um, it's uh, using movable shading devices to keep the unwanted heat gains out in the summertime. And it's using um, good glass, insulated glass, high, visi high visible light transmittance, relatively low solar heat gain coefficient. So it doesn't let in a lot of the heat, lets in more of the visible portion of the spectrum. And this is its, uh, its energy pie. And it's probably not a big surprise that even in this office building, the biggest energy user is heating followed by plug loads, and then the green is lighting at about 12%. So you can see in this building in Seattle, this was a surprise to me when I um, moved to Seattle two and a half years ago, that even in a commercial office building, nearly half the energy is for heating. Um, and then typically lighting and plug loads are the next two. This building, the lighting is pretty low because it you know, has a fairly narrow fo um, floor plate and a lot of glass. 
Okay. So that's, a, that's an example. I'm, I'm jumping ahead now to another concept real quick here. So we can see that this building comes in with an EUI of about 47.6 according to this model. Pretty good. Much better than the typical 70 or so for a, for a Seattle office building. So it's doing better. Better than most. What we need to do with all our buildings if we're going to satisfy Architecture 2030. And you can go to Architecture 2030 if, if you're um, not very familiar with it or unfamiliar with it. Basically what it says is by last year, every new building that we produce ought to use about half the energy of the existing stock of buildings. And the existing stock of buildings is typically, right now, the, 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 the um, reference is from CBEX, an acronym which stands for? Commercial Building Energy Consumption Survey. Thank you. And it's a, it's a survey of buildings around the country. You can type in your zip code and you can pull up, and I'll show you that in the Energy Star. You can't read this table, but so let me make it a little bigger. There we go. So what you can do is, let's say you're designing a K-12 school, you can look at the national average, and here's the site energy. That's the energy that's actually consumed on site. There's also the source energy, which has to do with the actual energy from because some of it's coming from natural gas, some of it's coming from electricity. If it's coming from electricity, there are some losses from the source of that energy to, act, to how it's supplied at the building. But we're interested really in the site EUI. So for a K-12 school, the national average would be about 74.7. Uh, 74 so 50% better is 37.3. 2030 actually says that in 2010, we now need to be 60% better or we should aim at 60% better. So part of the process of doing a new building is to benchmark it. What's your target? And this is the way you start to benchmark. You can also do this more accurately through the Energy Star website. And this is called Target Finder. Many of you have probably used this. And in Target Finder what you want to do is find a 50% target and then you select your building type and you put in your zip code and it looks more specifically at those building types that are available in your region which is much better because here in Boise you don't want to be set to the same standard as maybe Chicago or um, Madison. So as a for instance this is just a quick survey if we look at for a classroom using the same set of variables and you can only put in a few things like how many PCs there are and a little bit of equipment. We see these targets in Seattle for a classroom, about 29 in Seattle, 25 in San Luis Obispo, about 42 in Bozeman, 30 in Albuquerque, 26 in San Francisco. So for designers this gives us the target, the 2030 target for 50 percent better than what's out there. Yeah, yeah. Did you actually um, get this through Target Finder? Yeah. Okay. Yep. So these, these come directly from Target Finder, and they'll give you some additional information, like in your region, how much of that energy is typically coming from electricity and gas, which is kind of useful, and what you're paying for it. It's kind of interesting to see that we pay about the same for natural gas, but here in the Northwest, we pay quite a bit less for electricity than, say, in California. They pay about twice what we do. So you can go to Target Finder and you can pretty quickly benchmark your buildings. If you're going for net zero, the logical next step is to go, well, how much then can I collect on my buildings in terms of solar energy? The available energy on your side is going to be that you can convert into electricity is going to happen through either wind power, photovoltaics, most likely photovoltaics. You can get some of your energy needs from solar thermal, maybe a lot of them in this part of the world. And then usually the only other available source of energy is heat from the ground, which you can extract by per using a little energy uh, via ground source heat pump. Or if you're lucky and have hot rocks, then you're good to go. But this is a slide that Ed Masria likes to use. And Ed's a good friend, and I think it's a good provocative slide, but it's something that we have to, as designers, look at critically. And here's the thing that's missing. 
Um, it's meant to provoke us because it says, this is how much energy, even in, in gray, wintry Seattle, this is how many kilo BTUs per square foot land on a, a horizontal surface per year, per square foot, and on a vertical surface, a south vertical surface. And we can see it's about 275 per square foot on south vertical, 385 on a horizontal. And here's about a typical EUI for a residence, down here around maybe 40 per square foot, and maybe around 70 for that commercial building, right? So it kind of looks like the job is done. Anyone want to critically analyze that? What are we missing here? There's a couple things that are important to think about here. What are we missing? A way to collect the energy and convert it into electricity or thermal. That, that's right. How, how efficiently can you convert it? Because that's just the energy that's landing on those surfaces. That's one thing. Anything else? The, the other is maybe a little more subtle, and that is, especially in these kinds of buildings, you, if, if that's your collector surface, you might have to amortize that across two or three or four or five floors, because that's per square feet, right? So as soon as you have two floors, um, that cuts in half, and in half and in half, okay? If, if that's your surface. So that's the challenge we're after. And it turns out that um, when you use photovoltaics, and these are about the best photovoltaics on the market, that's about how much you're likely to collect in Seattle if you're converting it into electricity. You're likely to be able to collect about 55, and that's a pretty good number for Seattle. I, I didn't have a chance to do it for Boise, but I, I imagine it's higher. And about 39 per square foot that you can harvest and convert into electricity on a south vertical surface. So you start to see the problem of being net zero energy in, in, in uh, Seattle. So here's a, a, a great Sun Power 230 panel. There's our solar density. Panel efficiency is about 18 and a half. The actual cell is more like 22, but by the time you array them, there's spaces in between and um, inefficiencies in, in terms of getting that electricity into from DC to AC. So these are typical D rate factors and you're left with that 55. And you can go through the same exercise and find out what it is for different tilts and different orientations. And if you're interested in doing this, if you go to a website called PV Watts, PV Watts, W-A-T-T-S, do a Google search, there's a great calculator that you can very quickly do this analysis for your climate and very quickly find out how much energy per square foot am I likely to be able to convert into electricity? Okay. okay, so let me show you the Bullet Foundation building. This is called the Cascadia Center for Sustainable Design and Construction. Miller Hall are the architects, and Point 32 is the project developer. This is a project uh, for the, that is being led by the Bullet Foundation, and now they've pulled in a bunch of uh, collaborators. It's on a very prominent site in Seattle on Madison, Capitol Hill. There's Madison going diagonally through the site. 15th is the run, one running north-south. There's a little triangular park across the way, and this is the site. Some apartment buildings over to the east. When we started looking at this building at the Integrated Design Lab, Puget Sound, um, summer before last, we looked at the mix of uses, took it through Target Finder, went to 50% and came up with a target EUI of about 27.6 is what this building needed to be just to satisfy 2030 requirements. And if we look at a typical Puget Sound office, we were first of all, and I'll just show you real quickly, a little analysis we did very early before the design ever started just to try to get a sense of what our big challenges were. We decided to look at typical office use, energy uses and identified heating is the big one, lights is the next, uh, plug loads and lights, and then these others. So we thought, well, what can we do with heating? Let's just focus on the heating, and how can we lower that? And at this budget, if we give 34% of that budget over to heating, that means 
can we heat that building for about 9.4 kilobtus per square foot per year? So a little exercise to see what it would take to do that. Going back to location and form and orientation, we tried different forms just to see what, what's the effect of form on heating in this building. And not surprising, this more climate rejecting form, less surface to volume area, came up with a lower heating EUI. This building, which is probably more like the one we want, is going to use a little bit more energy because it's going to have more heat loss. And this also takes into account the heat gain through the south. But ne nevertheless, we decided to go ahead and continue on with this form. And we wanted to see, well, what's the effect of making a better and better envelope on this building? And this is a little bit hard to read the fine print, but what I'd like to point out here is just sort of the trajectory of this. This is um, greater and greater um, efficiency over our baseline EUI. And what we found is we added insulation and increasingly Im improved the quality of the windows. This is 30% glass, 30% of the facade area in glass, but with super high performance, triple pane, low E windows, and good insulation elsewhere, it looked like the EUI could be driven down to a number close to four from that 11 up there. So this was a, a pretty good indication to us that architecturally, one of the big strategies, important strategies for this building is a really good tight envelope. You know, good old kind of, uh, you know, not very sexy stuff, but important for saving energy. What happens though is as soon as you do all of these great things architecturally, a high performance envelope, active systems, passive systems, good mass, good daylighting and passive solar, really maximizing the use of, of natural energy, that this, how people inside the building start using energy becomes the really big one. And this slide kind of illustrates that. So if we look at a typical energy use before people, we start asking people to change their behavior. Here's that first bit of savings that's represented by making a better envelope, better systems, getting 38% savings architecturally right off the top by good design, good envelope, good architectural strategies. Take that, take that again and now we, what we see is that the plug loads start to become a very big piece of the energy that's still used plus the lighting that people can also control. The, the, the idea here is as soon as human behavior, turning off computers, using equipment effectively, and lighting effectively, that this is really a huge part of making a net zero energy building. And it's a part that we, as designers, have a different kind of influence over. So here's what the bullet building is striving for. Here's a Energy Star building of the same program. Here's Seattle Energy Code says that the building should have an EUI of about 64. A LEED Platinum building that gets 10 energy credits for the LEED for the bullet building would be about 32. But the designers are going on this assumption that they can get the building down to an EUI of 22 and that means that our PV budget has to be is 22. And this represents how much is going to be collected from a horizontal surface and from a vertical surface. It looks like that number is actually closer to 17 that we can get here. So this has to shrink accordingly. And that's what the designers at Miller Hall are up to right now. Let me show you what they've done. We first, a year ago, right about now, took it through a design studio um, with students at the University of Washington. And here are some of the concepts that they came up with. This is looking at the north side of the building. You can start to see the, the photovoltaic panels really expressing themselves up there. Um, living green wall, careful amount of glass. Not nearly as glassy as uh, Weber Thompson. 
Here on the south side, you can start to see the photovoltaics really expressing themselves in the facade treatment of the building. And what we start to discover here is there's this tension between um, surfaces for photovoltaics and surfaces for gla clear glazing and daylighting. And that becomes a, real, a really interesting challenge. Here's a third team. And you can see that each of these teams, um, it's, it's hard to tell from the previous two illustrations, we're back to alphabet buildings. This one happens to be the O. We had a couple of V's and an O. But they all had, oh, here's the third one. And there's that pocket park. It's pretty interesting to see now, after the first design shred, this is what Miller Hall came up with. And you can start to see again that something's going on in the middle of that building and that tension between the PV. And what's, what they're starting to do is really extend that solar collecting surface over the right of way and getting, um, working with the city to get permission to extend the big sombrero out over the building. This is affectionately called the, the, the big sombrero and the comb over. Here's the big south-facing photovoltaics. Here's some early studies, and you can start to see the evolution. They have really tried over the last nine months in pre-design. They're just an early pre-design, just moving into schematic design. Um, you can start to see some courtyard design, trying to keep that floor plate relatively narrow, trying to open up to that park. But you can really start to see what a big, architectural effect this photovoltaic panel, photovoltaic panels have. If this building is successful, it, um, it successfully realized, uh, its aim is to achieve the living building challenge, which means net zero, energy, net zero energy and net zero water, as well as a number of other imperatives. So it'll collect all its own water, uh, purify what it uses, and behave like the site will behave pretty close to what it was like before anything was ever built on it. In other words, it'll, it'll return some of the water to the aquifer and evaporate the rest. Two competing schemes right now is this kind of courtyard atrium scheme. You can see on an upper floor this atrium, a stair, one of the, the big uses of energy, once you've driven all the other sort energy uses down, is the elevator. So the designers are trying really hard to make what they're calling an irresistible stair. So the people will be drawn to the stair and use it instead of the elevator. Um, it's, it's really important that the systems all be uh, integral and part of the expression of the building, going back to the Larkin building and uh, the Victoria Hospital. This is actually the preferred option right now. And what's surprising about it is its upper floor plates start to look a lot more like a conventional office in that it has this core with building around, moving it back and creating these terraces on either side. Those terraces, part of their purpose is to provide green space to help use some of the water on site that's necessary. Um, this is a less complicated building also. Maybe surprisingly, the concept also is for this building to be a, t a heavy timber frame building, not concrete, not steel. Um, and here you can start to see some of the early concepts. We'll be hearing a lot more about this building over the next two years as hopefully it moves through uh, design and, and uh, into construction in about a year and a half. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that choice for the timber frame? Yeah. You know, one of the observations that was made about buildings in Seattle is that some of the longest lasting, most uh, durable and flexible and adaptable buildings in Seattle are these old timber frame buildings like the Polson building that Miller Hall and Malam are located in. Um, the intention is for this building to last at least 250 years. and. Uh, Timber, heavy timber frame, if the existing buildings are good evidence of, of this, are really durable and really adaptable buildings. Um, also part of the living building challenge is, that, is the materials 
the uh, composition of the, the structure has to have very low environmental impact. Uh, concrete has a relatively high environmental impact, as does steel, for different reasons. And uh, sustainably harvested timber is a more environmentally friendly solution. So that's part of the reason for this. It has some interesting consequences, one of which being we're trying, um, the designers are trying to drive daylight into the building, but you can't have a big timber beam you know, across the face of that building keeping the daylight from coming in. So one interesting strategy is to upturn the beams at the perimeter. So rather than supporting the floor at the end, it's actually, the floor is actually hanging from it at the end, and that becomes part of the facade so you can open up that glass at the, at the outside edge. Composting toilets um, will be in this building, some urban agriculture. Um, it's a very interesting building. Just went through its first phase of uh, design review. These images were used in it, and there's a lot of concern about this PV panel, and you know a lot of, of, of understandable concerns from the neighbors, and also from people who wonder, well, what will the technology be like in 20 years? And um, I think the the response has been, we need to set the bar really high. We need to achieve this standard. As the technology improves, the panels will start disappearing over time, or and maybe if they have a long life, move to their neighbors, start going on to other buildings. Um, but rather than think, well, why don't we just connect this to a wind machine in Yakima and you know, call it a day, um, the idea of, of really holding their feet to the fire is, is an important part of the lesson of this building and the story that uh, the developers want, want to tell. Why don't I just finish with a few other buildings that do a good job, um, some more than others. And uh, as, as we go through these, please pipe up anything you know about them or you have questions about them. You know, I bring this one forward. It, it, it's the um, uh, Lewis Center at Oberlin, which got a lot of attention about 10 years ago when it came online, uh, designed by uh, William McDonough. You know, one of the things I think, a cautionary note that we've learned from this building that Stephen Strong tells us, um, great PV designer, is, you know, when you design a roof like this, which is mostly about architectural expression and not about, you know, a sensible place to put the PVs, um, you have to be careful because a PV is a big circuit. You know, these, think of it, this is Stephen Strong's analogy, as a bunch of um, dogs pulling a dog sled. They all need to be pulling at the same at the same rate, and this is like having chihuahuas and huskies on the same dog sled, because they're all, each, each orientation is collecting energy at a different rate. So they have to be circuited separately rather than as a whole. So it doesn't, it, the, the expression doesn't quite match the utility here. Um, I think this all, building also probably suffers from more glass than is perhaps appropriate in this climate, but you know, it was a good effort, and I think it was important to make something that was also architecturally significant. The Lilla Center um, at University of Oregon um, doing a nice demonstration of a combination on the south glass of embedded photovoltaic cells and clear glazing to demonstrate that balance of both collecting uh, energy for electricity as well as providing daylight to the atrium. Arguably, arguably pretty beautiful. I think this um, system by Powerlight for flat roof buildings where the photovoltaics are um, connected to a polystyrene panels that interlock. So you can create a big mat of these photovoltaic cells that help insulate the roof, extend the life of the roof, and really reduce the number of penetrations for that roof because they just have to be held down at the edges. It's a pretty great idea. Another pretty great PV idea is, are these thin films. Don't see these much in use. This was Unisolar's product. So a little out of date. Sim Vanderein put this product on his uh, houseboat in Sausalito. It's pretty invisible. The, other, the neighbors didn't mind at all. Couldn't see it. Um, but for a little house like this, this produced most of its electricity. And he got a nice rebate back in the day. Another nice integration of PVs and skylights. And then our solar decathlon house, which uh, won third place overall out of 17 teams in 2005 and tries to do its best to first adapt to the climate. We have a, a water trome wall behind this piece of glass, direct gain solar here, direct gain solar, 
shaded by PV and deciduous vegetation once it grows to keep the sun off in the winter in the summertime and let it in in the summertime in the winter time excuse me a nice terrace because our building happened to face the US Capitol so we could watch watch our legislators Parenthetically, that was one of the few sun, sunny days in the 10 days of the competition it rained, so it was kind of a solar battery competition, as it turns yeah. out. Uh, the Real Good Solar Living Center, I, I spent a number of years with Van Architects, and this is a building that does a really good job of responding to the climate by its orientation and form, and a really good envelope. It's, it's made, its walls are primarily uh, plastered straw bale. Uses some good strategies of keeping the summer sun out, Lots of thermal mass to temper indoor temperature swings, or temperature swings, summer and winter. Night flushing the building to, pr to chill that, um, all that mass during the summertime. Uh, comparator building of the time has that EUI of about 100. Uh, this building has an EUI down here around 20 but about 12 of that is produced on site by PV, so it only purchases about that much compared to its comparator building. I think more importantly, anecdotally, students at uh, UC Berkeley have studied this building and found that the temperature inside and out versus, inside versus outside, without any mechanical chilling, um, typically ranges around 14 to 16 degrees, and that's largely a function of night ventilation and storing up a lot of that thermal cool in the mass to take care of these overheated periods. So, you know, these smaller buildings give us a good, a, point us the way at having some confidence that we can achieve 50, 60, 70 percent less energy than what's out there. This is a building that's almost 30 years old that uh, came from Masria's, Ed Masria's office. Really handsome. I think it's it doesn't look at all dated today. It's a library in North Carolina. And you can get a sense of the daylighting and also um, solar strategies. I, I'm, I'm afraid I don't have another image of it. But these are some sawtooth clear stories that bring in winter heat and bring in daylight all year round. And then some nice louvers inside that help scatter that light and heat. This building. Again, nearly 30 years old. Here's the comparator buildings, um, uh, another public library in the community. And we can see that this building was using much less than half the energy of its comparators 30 years ago. A, a building from Ed Masria's, uh, excuse me, from Sim Vanderine's office, um, the De Anza uh, Environmental Center, Kirsch Center. Bay Area. And here you can start to see some of the strategies, elongated east-west, photovoltaics and solar thermal. And what I find interesting is the way the program is organized in these two different shapes. One shape is a skinny bar and one is much fatter and that accommodates the two types of program. Here on the south side you can see a lot of texture. Uh, which gives the building some expression and also keeps the summer sun out. The way that fat and skinny portion work is these portions of the building are all passively cooled and their only heating comes from in-floor radiant heating as necessary. Very simple kind of building. These that have a higher load, their lecture rooms, has displacement ventilation and mechanical, mechanically chilled air as needed. So there's the skinny portion, very simple section, keep the sun out, cross ventilate, and temper the building with the heating necessary in that slab. But in those lecture rooms, displacement ventilation and on these raised floors allows you to provide, in, when cooling is necessary, cooled air that helps cool only the portion of the room, or first the portion of the room where people are. And what that allows you to do, among other things, is allows you to bring in that cooled air at a slightly higher temperature 
than you would if you had to mix it. Here's a typical cooling supplier, 53 to 57, and this is 58 to 63, and that's significant because in this climate, there's a lot of times where you can take that air directly from outside without having to turn on the chiller. This diagram's a little hard to read, but basically what it tells you is in that climate, there's a lot of hours of free cooling if you can provide the cooled air you need at a slightly higher temperature than you would in that other system. So that's one reason displacement ventilation uses less energy. And this design, here, here's the, our ASHRAE 90.1 comparator. Here was the building at the end of design development, modeled to use about half as much energy. And then after you displace this much energy with PV, this is how much is actually purchased. So again, these are all buildings that are getting us to, to 2030. And here's just a few images of the completed building. Not quite as exuberant as the schematic drawings, but a building that's doing pretty well. Let me finish off with this building. This is a project that, that um, I was the, the project manager for when I was at Sims office. It's a renovation of a building from the late 30s in Kentucky, a classroom building. Didn't have central air conditioning. It had a few rooms with air conditioners. I, this was my favorite, that little unit placed up in that room. Psychrometric chart. And this was one of our first clues for a design response. This is beautiful terrazzo floors. At the entry, there was this disc that gave us the inspiration for one of our major strategies, which was to do what's typically done in the South, which is provide a place to stack ventilate. You see lots of buildings in the South with cupolas for lighting and stack ventilation. This building didn't have such a passageway. And each floor was disconnected from the one below. So by cutting a hole through the floor, uh, we were able to provide a great big stack ventilator, a skylight, and also a path, a return air path, so we could avoid ducts to, br to bring the, in, in, in mechanical mode, bring the return air back into the mechanical spaces up here for conditioning and return to the spaces. And there's looking up that new skylight. So there are some of the strategies, cross ventilation using transom windows across the corridor to cross ventilate and to stack ventilate. Oh. At nighttime, either open the windows or use the mechanical system to flush the building on those nights when it's cool enough because it's a nice, massive building, a lot of thermal mass in this building. Um, the only water use in this building is, or the primary water use in this building is to flush toilets. And so with a 12,000 gallon rainwater catchment system hooked up to the toilets, um, they were able to really reduce the amount of purchased water. Green materials, saving some of the nice existing materials and using better. So here's before and before, during, taking it down to its bones, and then after. Um, a lot of the standard features, well insulated envelope, better windows, removing that, that um, suspended ceiling so we could connect the building with a thermal mass of the ceiling, linoleum on the floor that doesn't limit the thermal uh, mass very much, and then transom windows, clear stories before in the hallways, and then after with the uh, skylight and borrowed daylight from the sides. The way this building was modeled, and Arup out of New York did our energy modeling for us, is we looked at the existing condition, a new design case and looked at different strategies and how much each of these reduced the energy use. And this is where we were at the end of, um, at the end of schematic design. Unfortunately, at the end of construction documents, our model bumped back up. 
But it, that's an important lesson and another one that we're, we're trying to act on now at the IDL is to try to track all the buildings we're working on through each phase of design and then into occupancy. But still a building that uses about half as much energy as it did before. One of the important parts of this building is to help the users of this building sail their building. So there's a little door card, laminated, two sides, showing the open mode and the closed mode. This was about 10 years ago, and so today's buildings that use this strategy are more sophisticated, but we have a little red light that tells you you're in open mode. And when the light's off, probably ought to shut the windows and let the mechanical system take over. But there are still strategies users can do to make themselves comfortable. And an early dashboard, again, 10 years old, but here's a couple touch screens in public spaces in the building, allow you to toggle through and see how much energy the building is using. Here's where the chillers come on, and here's the other loads in the building. Another important part of managing energy in buildings is being able to see what we're using. I started with David Orr, and I think I'll, I'll, I'll finish with a quote from David Orr, too, because it started a, perhaps a, with a question of where, where's our hope in all of this, and I, I'm going to finish with his words. And he says that in the face of the remorseless working out of these large numbers, do we have reason to be optimistic? Optimism is a bet that the odds are in our favor. Hope is the faith that things will work out whatever the odds. Hope is a verb with its sleeves rolled up. Hopeful people are actively engaged in defying the odds or in changing the odds. And I think that's uh, what our work is as designers, to actively roll up our sleeves and uh, work against the odds and uh, make some of these great buildings. Thanks a bunch, y'all. I'm happy to take any questions or comments or yeah. get any feedback. Yeah. The example of the middle hall project, yeah. uh, you know, you showed how it was, uh, you did some analysis for optimizing the, the reduction in the heating load. Yeah. But then there are other energy users that are maybe contradictory as far as a architectural form and how do you synthesize all those competing yeah. uh, design criteria. Yeah, and they really are competing. And it's been such an interesting process um, to you know, turn over our early work that was done in a design studio and you know, in, in kind of absence of having to really deliver on the building and watch the struggles of these really talented architects. Um, you, know, you can imagine the number of, of uh, of challenges, not least of which the challenge of providing a well daylit building while at the same time providing um, you know, panels that are collecting solar energy. Um, it seems like every time you push one way, something pushes the other way. That's, I, I think those of you who have been practicing architecture know that that's, that's how, it, how it works and I think in this building it's probably doubly so in all cases. I don't know if there's a simple answer. I think, I think what the designers have done their best to do is um, to not paint themselves into any corners at the beginning. Maybe that's about as good as an answer as I can give. Through a collaborative and integrated design process, they brought together a lot of talent from the engineering community, um, the landscape community, and uh, the designers to try to make early decisions that would have minimize the amount of rubbing against each other later on. If, if there's a, a more specific piece of that I might answer, I'd be, I'd be happy to try. So that's my general answer. I thought maybe there was a magic computer <laughs> program. <laughs> you know, I, I, the, I, I'll tell you what has been happening is um, PAE engineers out of Portland have been doing the mechanical they have been running mostly, I believe, eQuest models. And uh, 
those have been very helpful to track different, different shoebox options to look at these different parties and try to get a sense of which ones are performing better than others. Any other questions? Well, I'll ask one. Oh, there's one. Okay, good. <laughs> This is a specific question about the Williams building in Boston. I think that was the building that had the flat photovoltaics on the roof, oh. which interests me because it snows there. Uh -huh. And it's also at about the same latitude as we are here. Yeah. And I was thinking about Stephen Strong and, the, you know, talking about the yeah. optimal use of. Right, right. That's, that's a very good question. I mean, why? I, the, the question in general is, does it make sense to put photovoltaics flat in snow country, one question. Why would you do that? Um, and I think the answers to those questions are, certainly whenever they're covered with snow, they're not producing much energy. I think also they're not producing a lot of energy in the winter time anyway, because the sun is so low. These are really aimed at, at so that the penalty probably isn't terrible. Now, the, the reason for flat photovoltaic panels, certainly on the bullet building, and in a case like that, certainly it's a lot cheaper and easier to do than putting them on racks. But also, as soon as you put them on racks, then you have to start spacing them so that one doesn't sh shade the next. And you simply can't get as much panel on in that configuration. And even when you think about, well, that's a more optimum um, orientation in Seattle, because we get most of our sun in the summertime, that starts aiming for getting them lower anyway. And then when we need to get so many on there, every analysis was done of different possibilities, ultimately aimed at just putting them completely flat to maximize the number so that you don't shade them. And the penalty, curiously in Seattle, the penalty for flat versus optimum, which in Seattle, the, the, the default optimum for a photovoltaic panel tilt is tilt at your latitude. But that assumes pretty much year-round weather conditions that are more or less similar in terms of how much sun you're getting. Um, in Seattle, it's more like about 34 degrees, so a little bit flatter. It'd be interesting to see what it is in Boise, which you could do pretty quickly with PV watts. But by the time you get them flat, it's still only a penalty of around 12% over the optimum on an annual basis. Well, I had one last question about the yep. bullet building. Yep. Um, what are some of the user strategies that are being discussed, especially related to their involvement in operating the building and plug loads? Yeah, yeah, plug loads is a huge one, a few. One that Dennis Hayes has suggested is actually giving each tenant a budget. And so you have a, an electrical budget that then you creatively within your your building, you, you, you have only so much juice to use, so you're given an energy budget. Now, if you, if you use less, you can sell some of your energy budget to one of your neighbors. So this is sort of, you know, carbon trading on a, on a building scale, so that's an interesting one. I think some of the other strategies have a lot to do with being able to see what you're using. So the idea of building dashboards that are providing you information about how much you're using and using that to change behavior. That's one. Maybe if you see that the office next to you is using half the energy you're using, there's that kind of competitive thing that happens when you get your utility bill and it says here's how much you've used and here's how much the average is being used in your neighborhood. That apparently has been one of the most effective ways to get people to lower their energy. Um, and I, the other thing is, is really good controls. Um, there is a, a new company called um, Adura, A-D-U-R-A, which has a really nice lighting control that allows you to put about sort of a Tootsie Roll sized relay, a wireless relay, in each of your fluorescent fixtures, as a, for instance, connected to your light switch, so you don't have to rewire. One thing you can then start to do is schedule your lights or connect them to occupancy sensors or daylight sensors. Plus, you can, it, fully, it, it continuously monitors how much energy the lights are using. So information, feedback, uh, Sim Vanderen calls it stewardship, you know, looking at that constant, looking back, stewarding your, your, your project, I think is, in general, what, what they're doing. 
Well, uh, on behalf of the University of Idaho Integrated Design Lab and uh, Better Bricks, Idaho Power, Northwestern Energy, and now Avista, uh, thanks for coming. And uh, we'll hopefully see you again uh, two weeks from tonight, I believe, is the next, uh, the next lecture. So thank you, Rob, for, for uh, showing us all these cool projects. Appreciate it.